Bibles with you this morning. I hope you do. Uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 is where we will be. We're going to take a break this morning from our uh, our study in first, uh, Second Peter, rather, and uh, take a look at the Christmas story. And I used to be one of those who kind of thought about the Christmas story and thought, well, how can I do this in a fresh way? The same old story again and again. But really, the more I read and the older I get, I think, how could you ever exhaust this story? Uh, it, it's not, and it's not hard to come up with a sermon for Christmas time. It's actually rather easy uh, because there's so much there. Uh, and so this morning, I want to turn our attention to the the difference between wise men and foolish men. And I believe that we'll see this in Matthew chapter two as we read through verses one through twelve. But before we get started, let's just pause and ask that the Lord would help us as we open His Word this morning. Dearly Father, we come to you again. We are so delighted to be able to freely open your word. We help us to never take that uh, ability for granted. For we also ask that you would help us and guide our thoughts and guide our thinking. That it would align with your word. Help us to put any kind of prejudices or biases about your word to the side. Help us to come to the word seeking truth. Seeking the pure truth that comes from it, that flows from it. So Lord, we ask for your guidance and your help. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In Matthew's gospel, there's a little bit of a differential, uh, or a little bit of a difference between how Matthew records the story or how Luke records the story. Mark leaves out the story altogether because he wants to show us Jesus as a suffering servant. Matthew wants to show us uh, Jesus as king, and so that's why he spends chapter one uh, telling us about the genealogy. He tells us about Joseph's family and how Joseph is from the line of David. And so that fulfills prophecy in the sense that uh, the scriptures say, and Old Testament uh, scriptures say, that Jesus will come from the line of David. And so Matthew is writing to the Jews. Luke will be writing to the Gentiles. Matthew's writing to the Jews, and he's presenting his whole book, his whole letter, on this idea. Jesus is king. Jesus is king of the Jews. He's king of the world. And so this is what his account is about. This is how he... Uh, puts into words the account about Jesus' life. So that's the reason for the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. As we come to the week of Christmas, and I hope that all month you've been thinking about the birth of our Savior. We, uh, Tracy and her team have decorated the church. We have a manger here. And I don't think it, that it's, um, we, we, to be honest with you, we had a little bit of trouble with the cross, the placement of the cross, right? We was out here, and we were trying to figure out we wanted it back here. But as, as, as uh, Billy was singing and as the secret were singing, you can see right through the cross, the, the lighted cross, to the cross that had the, the crown of thorns uh, on, on top of it. And Jesus was a, one, a baby that was born to die. And in his 33 years here on this world, he spent giving us the gospel. He is the gospel. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. So as we come to this scene this morning, I hope that this will kind of cement perhaps this particular event in the Christmas story in your mind as you celebrate with your friends and family uh, this Christmas season. And hopefully later today, the rest of this week, you'll continue to think about the things that are found in Scripture about the birth of our Lord. So with that in mind, I'd like to read Matthew chapter 2, and we'll read this account in verses 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all in Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Verse 7, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, 
they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being, born, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. In this passage that we've just read, we're really introduced to two groups of people, two types of people that are in this passage. There's foolish people and there's wise people. Matthew's not just telling us the story at the beginning of Jesus' life. He's showing that there's a difference in people and the way they respond to Jesus as king. This news of a newborn king fell on two different groups and fell on two different sets of ears. Then it's a, in this particular account, these two groups of people, they are present, they are there, they are accounted for, and they are presented with information. The information is there's a new king in town. There's a new king that's been born. Our aim this morning is to see the difference in how these two groups of people receive this news. So the first thing that I'd like to do for us this morning is notice the location, and that's told to us right in verse 1, the location of the account. This says in verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Now when you and I hear the word Bethlehem, when, when we hear that, uh, that, that, that town, the name of that town, we're pretty familiar with the name of that town, aren't we? we think, the first thing we think of, and probably the only thing that you think of when you hear Bethlehem, is the town in which Jesus was born. And really, there's not much going on in this town. It's a town that's about five or six miles south of Jerusalem. It's a little country town. Really, the only thing significant that happened in this town, it's mentioned a few times in Scripture, but the, really the only thing significant is about it is that it's the hometown, or it's the birthplace of David. This is where David was uh, of born. And so that is why, when you study Luke's account, when they say, uh, when it says there that they're uh, sent back to their hometown to be taxed uh, and, and to be accounted for, there's a census going on. That's why Joseph goes back to uh, uh, Bethlehem uh, because that's David's town, and he was a, a relative of David there, a descendant of David, and that was to fulfill prophecy in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. That's how we know uh, a little bit about Bethlehem. And so this is the town in which David was born, in which he was from, in which also the long-awaited greater David, the Messiah, would be born. So when I think that perhaps the only, thing, the only reason we know about Bethlehem, uh, the only thing we know about Bethlehem is that it's Christ's birth, is that we would know that it's the town of Christ's birth. So this is the location of the account. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. The second thing I want to point out to you in verse 1 is this. It's the time of the account. Now, after chapter 1, some time has passed between the writing of chapter 2, or between the events, or rather, of chapter 2. In chapter 1, Matthew acknowledges the, the birth of Christ very briefly, and he continues on with the events of his life. So it says, now after Jesus was born. So sometime after, when we come to chapter 2, Jesus is born, and something uh, has has happened. They're no longer at the nativity, as we would say. But notice down in verse 11, it says, where the wise men came to see the baby. It's not at the inn, it's not in the manger, but it's in a house. So they're still in this region. And, and by the way, they're about, uh, Joseph and Mary had been living in an area in Nazareth, which is about 90 miles away. So they made this trip 90 miles to Bethlehem, that is which about five or six miles from Jerusalem. So they're still there. They have not left yet. Uh, perhaps they uh, were, were seeing family, perhaps uh, because of the, baby, the birth of the baby boy. Uh, they're, they're having to stay there for a little while. But several months, four, five, or six months now, has passed before these wise men are able to see him. So that is a little bit of background. We've got, we've got the location, which is Bethlehem, and the time is about five or six months or so after the birth. Now, still in verse 1, we're introduced to the two groups of people that I want us to take a look at this morning. In verse 1, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, 
So here's our two groups of people. First is Herod, and the second group is wise men. Well, you can kind of tell that wise men is a group. It, men is more than one, right? There's, that's a group. But when we say Herod, you say, well, that's not really a group of people. There's gonna, we're going to add more to uh, that group in just a minute. And we're going to label the wise men. Now, this is really deep, so I want you to really hang on to this. We're going to label the wise men wise men. Okay? All right, so hold on to that. And then we're going to label the other group of people foolish people. Okay? So Herod and his group, another group, uh, another group of people that are going to join Herod, we're going to label as foolish. Okay? So we've got the foolish men and the wise men. And the first group I want to talk about this morning is, is King Herod. We'll meet King Herod, and then we'll meet the group that joins with him in just a little bit. King Herod was a, a, from a line of uh, rulers. Uh, his father was a king. He was an Idumean king. He was an Edomite, kind of the same word there. He's not a Jew, in other words. But King Herod, <clears throat> his father's name was Antipater, and Antipater was a man who was a ruler for Rome. He ruled for Rome. Uh, Rome kind of hired him to be a, uh, a king or a ruler. And so uh, Herod kind of grew up in this household. And there was a town called Galilee, not too far away, uh, where they needed a ruler. And so they, they put Herod, Antipater's son, in charge of Galilee, kind of a rural area. And he was kind of serving more like a prince. And his father was serving more like a governor or a procreator, someone a little bit higher up. And, and Rome is, is using these people to control the Jews, okay? So they, they're the ones that are in charge. They're the ones that are on the scene, and they're keeping the Jews in check. You can kind of have your God. You can have your religion. <clears throat> as long as you don't get out of line uh, and try to overthrow Rome, you can worship whoever you want to worship. And so uh, uh, Herod then becomes this uh, kind of this prince, or so, so to speak, our, our second lieutenant governor. He's not the main one in charge until his father passes away and dies. And he sees this chance to control the throne or to rule and get a, a group, a larger group of people. And so he goes to Rome. He said, during, during a battle, he slips off on a ship, goes to Rome. He says, listen, I am pro-Roman. I'm for you guys. I don't like the Jews. I'm with you guys. Make me a ruler, and, and I will help you along. And so Roman checks the guy out and says, hey, you're, you're good to go. We, we like that idea. We're going to actually give you an army. And you go fight for your particular area that you want to be king, and we'll help you along, and you control the Jews. This is in about 40 B.C., or 40 years before the birth of Christ. So Herod takes this army, and he's fighting for his right to be king. King of who or what? The Jews, okay? That's very important that we hang our hat on that and, and nail that down. So he goes and fights a battle or a war for about three years, to, and, and, and after this battle, he is now recognized by Rome as king of the Jews. So this is the setting, this is the scene in which takes place that, that Matthew is helping us understand as the kind of the background information as we read this account. Now, who's the other group? This other group is the wise men. Well, who are they? Well, the question that they ask really serves as a clue to who they are. So let's look at their question. <clears throat> It says in verse 2, they came saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? So how does that include? Because they were people, they were Persians who came and they were kind of kingmakers in that time. They were wise men and they, they were well thought of, they were well educated uh, uh, people in that day. I believe that there's probably more than three. We kind of, when we do a nativity or something or a, a play in a church setting, we always kind of give them three wise men because why? There's three gifts, right? But probably moving in around this area, the, the, the distance that they had to travel, most likely there's a large group of these people. There's a vast group. They had to have food. They had to have uh, cam uh, camels and horses. They had to have animals. So they had to have animals for eating on this distance. They take a large group of people to be able to go the journey in the distance that they did. And they are in search of a king. So these wise men are going from the east in search of a king. They needed a king for their particular nation, and they are king makers. So whoever they deem uh, uh, legitimate as king, the nation will then recognize that this is a candidate to become our king. So they're, they're on this mission then to go and find a king. 
So this large entourage comes, and they come into Herod, uh, into Jerusalem, and they're, they're going around asking the people first, you know, where is he? Where is he? Because they had a little bit of idea they know the history of the Jewish nation. They knew that the kings came out of the Jewish nation, and so they, they know the, uh, the Old Testament prophecy, and they come no, uh, seeking this king. Now what is interesting, during this time, and, and I could spend probably five or ten minutes, I'm going to spare you the, the academic part of this, but historians, as a group of people, tell us that during this time, for whatever reason, it's not really accounted for the reason, but there was an unusual mood that there would be one who would be arising as king and a savior of the world. I'm not talking about savior of, of sins, right? But in, in, a, in, a, in a worldly way, a savior of uh, a ruler that would come up. And there's just this unusual mood that one would be coming. Perhaps that came from the readings of Galatians, where it says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth, forth his son to, to be made of a woman made under the law. Perhaps this was the working of the Holy Spirit that, that stirred in the people's heart that in the, this was the fullness of time, that it was here, and that as Jesus was born, this was the time. So there's, there's, a, there's a, sense in which, a sense in which this time had come to pass. Now, there is something about this question that makes uh, the wise men ask that really just, the, the question that the wise men ask that just really sets King Herod off. I mean, he is a, he just absolutely loses it. They're, they, they, these particular group, this particular group of people, they must have been somewhat recognizable, right? They come into town, this large entourage, they're, they're, they're dressed differently, they're from a different part of the world, they've got different clothes on, they, they're perhaps wealthy, uh, and so they come in, and they come up to the townspeople first, which would be the Jewish nation, right? And they're asking, where's the king of the Jews, right? He's in the palace. I, I don't know. What are you talking about? The king of the Jews. He's that it's Herod, right? They're, they're not looking for the Messiah. Okay, that's kind of the underlying fact there. So they go up to the to the palace and knock on the on the palace door. Herod, hey, who's in there? We're looking for the king of the Jews. You don't go asking the king where the king of the Jews is, right? And so Matthew wants us to see that this is this is a, a, a contradiction here. That this is something in contrast. You don't go asking the king where the king is. What are you talking about? I'm the king. No, we're looking for the one that's just been born, right? Yeah, oh, well, oh, okay. So now we got to understand a little bit about Herod. We're going to understand more about him at the end of the sermon. But this really, really sets him off. And notice verse 3. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jer uh, Jerusalem with him. So the, the reaction that King Herod has is that he is troubled. That means he's concerned. He's angered. He's, he's angered. He's confused. What are you talking about that you're looking for the king of the Jews? I'm right here. And, and, and I don't have to claim this. Rome claims this. You don't have to look to me. I'm not self-satisfying myself. This is who Rome says I am. In fact, he would hold on to that title all the way to his death. Remember uh, what I said a few minutes ago. He worked hard for it. He fought a battle for it for three years. He came in a line of it, but he still has to prove himself. He buttered Rome up and says, hey, I'm with you guys. I've worked hard for it. And now these people are coming along and saying, have you seen him? Is he here? Where is he? The one that's been born, the king of the Jews. What are you talking about? So Matthew's painting this picture, the difference in these two people. You see, the Jews then had an expectation because they, uh, or rather the, the wise men, had an expectation because they knew their history. They looked into the Old Testament uh, prophecies and said, there's one here. There's a promised one here. We've seen a bright light. We're not sure. We don't understand all what that star is or what, it, what is coming from the sky, but we followed it here. And so you people must know we also know that you're the pro, you're the chosen race, right? And so you people must be really excited. Where is he? I'm sure you're, you've got scouts out and you're looking at every boy that's been born. In fact, a lot of the parents were naming their kids Jesus because they wanted their kid to be the Messiah, right? And so, and so they're like, where, where, is he in your house? Is he in your house? We'll go ask, we'll go ask Herod because they, they must be looking for the Messiah. 
Well, that's not exactly the case, unfortunately. They had read Daniel. They had read the Old Testament prophets concerning the birth of the Messiah. They knew their history. They'd seen the star. They have something dwelling up inside of them as some kind of, the, what we would know as the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to say, go to Jerusalem and you'll find the Messiah. You'll find the one, the promised one. So they come asking the question, where's the new king? Where's the, and, and they ask it thinking, they're going to be so excited to tell us. They're going to be worshiping him. Well, this news does not go over well. And here we meet the second group of people, or, or rather the group that joins Herod, the foolish people. Notice what verse 3 says. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and so was all of, Jer of Jerusalem with him. They're all troubled. And, and I think the trouble that, that Jerusalem has, and, and it's not all as in every single person, it's all in the majority. Because we know Simeon and Anna were looking for the promised one. There's probably some others, but it's it's two or three, right? It's, it's not a large group of people as, as the, the whole nation is not longing and looking for the Messiah. It's only one or two sprinkled among a remnant, as the scriptures tell us. But I believe that the Jews were fearful. They're concerned that they were angry because they if, if another king comes up, we're, we're having to we're having we're having to to, to uh, mold our lives after what King Herod wants for us, and they lived in fear. We're going to talk more about King Herod in just a second, but they take sort of kind of figured out life under King Herod. It wasn't pleasant. It wasn't great. And so when they hear this this news of another king, it's like I got to change my ways to fit that guy, whoever this next king might be, and it might cost me my life. And, you know, I can't do things the way Herod wants anymore. I've got to do things. I've got to change. And so they're troubled. They're angry. And they're confused. Along with King Herod. So, unfortunately, the Jews had become numb. They had become oblivious to their own religion's prophecy. They had the scriptures. In fact, most of them probably could recite large passages of the Old Testament scripture prophesying that there would be one born, as Mike says, out of Bethlehem. But they neglected that. They skipped over that. And here come in some foreigners from another nation, from another group of people coming into their nation and seeking the king of the Jews. Both groups are pagans. Both groups are, are not followers of the true way. Just like Herod, the nation of Israel is now corrupt. They're not longing for the Messiah. They're oblivious to the fact of the Messiah. How do you know that? Because nobody went five miles south to see him. He was only six miles away. And no one but the shepherds and the wise men are there. The nation of Israel is corrupt. But we have no reason to believe at this point that the wise men are true followers of God at this point. There's a difference in these two groups. Herod, according to verse 4, doesn't even remember a thing about the Messiah. Of course, he's not a Jew, but he would understand some things about the people in which he was lord over. And their Old Testament prophecy says that there's a king that's going to be coming. But they don't even remember it as well. So in verse 4, he says, he, it, it, Matthew tells us that they assembled all the chief priests and the scribes and the people. And he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So he said, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back and pull out the filing cabinet, unravel the scrolls, and in there, there's some kind of prophecy, there's something's going on, because how in the world did wise men so far thousands of miles away know to come here to look for a king? What's going on? They call him the Christ. They call him the Messiah. What's going on? So he tells them, go back and look at the filing cabinet, man. Go back and research it and tell me, where is he to be born? So they do. And I don't think it takes them much time. They knew. They just wanted to blot that out of their memory. They didn't want, they didn't want a, a Messiah because they were corrupt. So they told him, verse 5, in Bethlehem of Judea, six miles south, for so it was written by the prophet. And so they, they tell him where they get the information. They said, back, back in Micah. 
Chapter 5, verse 2, it says, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Saying Bethlehem's not just insignificant. It's going to be very significant. It's going to be the birthplace of the Lord. The ruler. A ruler shall come who will shepherd my people. And so now, King Herod has the information that he was asking for. Where is the Christ? Where's, where was he going to be born? Right where... Right, five miles south, right under their nose. Here's the difference. Herod and his group, the foolish group of the Jews, they flat out rejected the Messiah and blotted the nation, blotted this out of their, this notion out of their minds. While the other group, the wise men, came under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knowing a little bit about the, the Pentateuch in the Old Testament and then seeing some kind of star, some kind of light in the sky, they come. Believing in that, not sure exactly what all this is going to entail, looking for the promised one. See, the, the, the contrast is, the difference is, is so, it, it hits the reader right in the eyes when you read through the scripture. The Jews and Herod, they knew where he was to be born. They had all of that lineage and history of where he was to be born, and they're five miles away. But they're not seeking after him. They're not longing after him. They're not expecting the Messiah to come. While you have the wise men who are a long way off, no bits and pieces about the Old Testament, and they come seeking the promised one. What does Matthew want us to see here? I believe that Matthew's constant attitude of condemnation of the leadership of Judah and Judaism, his constant sensitivity that God is opening the church for who? The Gentile world. We, when we look through the Gospels, when we look through Acts and Romans, Paul and Peter are going back and forth a little bit about who is the Gospel for? It's only for the Jews. And, and, and they finally come to the realization, no, it's for the world. It's for the Gentile world. Where does this begin? I believe Matthew is showing that God intended the gospel to go to all the world, even at his birth, because Gentiles are coming from thousands of miles away to see the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's opening the world for the Gentiles to come. So we have seen the arrival of these two groups, the foolish group and the wise group, that, that pertain to this particular account. I want you to notice also the agitation here. King Herod, this does not say well of King Herod. And part of the situation that was going on in Jerusalem is that Herod knows that the Jews don't particularly like him. In fact, they hate him. But they've got to be submissive to him if they're going to live, if they're going to have a family, if they're going to have a job, if they're going to have any kind of recreation, they've got to be submissive. But the situation becomes tense because now there's speak of a new king. And Herod was self-motivated. He was uh, self-concerned. And now you have a group of people coming from the east that are coming into the Roman Empire, in which he's a branch of, he's in charge of, talking about a new king. And if this new king goes back, uh, back east and sets up some kind of confederacy or a revolution, then they could potentially overthrow Rome. So you see... Herod could really get in a lot of hot water here if he if anything threatens his throne. Well, these kingmakers come into Jerusalem asking about this new king. It doesn't set well, and he becomes agitated. In verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. You see, you would think that as, as, as the wise men come into the land of the Jewish nation, where they know the scripture about a promised one, and they begin to ask, you would think that they would say, oh, really? You think that you wise men, you think that uh, uh, the, king is, the new king has been born? I believe I remember something about that. And they go back to their scriptures as unraveled, and they begin to read, and they read Micah 5 too. You would think that a whole host of people would re be ready to overthrow Herod in the throne. I, but that doesn't happen. But it does happen in the mind of Herod. 
Herod says if the Jews get a hold of this, if they get a hold of the fact that their king has just been born in Bethlehem, they're going to rise up and they're going to lead a revolt and overthrow me, and not only me, Rome. So his whole kingdom is in jeopardy, but it only happens in his mind. It's not a reality. Because why? We don't see a whole host of people going down to Bethlehem with the wise men, right? It falls on deaf ears. Where's the king of the Jews? And they, the Jews never pick up on it. Herod does, though, and he gets agitated. He's upset. In John chapter 1, verse 11, you remember this. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. It, this news of the king of the Jews doesn't resonate. They're not looking. They're so unrepentant of their wickedness and their sins. And, and, and they, their sin has driven a wedge between them and their relationship with Almighty God. And they're not even looking for him. So when a group of wise men come into the town, they're so foolish that they don't even pick up on this terminology of king of the Jews to know that he's been born. You see, these people had more fear of Herod than, of Herod than they did the confidence in the word of God. We're living in a day, there's a lot of fears going on in there. But listen, your, your amount of fear for what's going on in the world should not overshadow the amount of fear that you have for God. You can still trust in God. You can still have faith in God. Notice what it says. He was troubled in all of Jerusalem with him. Why are they troubled? Because they feared him so much. And they had a lot to fear. Let me just take just a few seconds and describe here for just a minute. To put it, put it in our vernacular, he was a bad dude, okay? He was a wicked dude. He's a wicked man. Let me just describe him a little bit. Even though there's a lot of positives about him as far as his ability and what he was able to do, he's a very smart man. Uh, obviously, if he can um, go to Rome and say, hey, I'm on your side, they give him an army that he goes and fights for three years and wins, he has built for himself a kingdom. So he, he's... A political genius, he's smart, all of these things, but he's a very wicked man. He was incredibly jealous. He was always looking out for someone that might come and steal his throne. He was hopelessly suspicious, as we would say. Is that the next guy? Is that the next person that's going to knock me off and steal my throne? So he spends his entire life plotting the murder of people. He was always plotting murders. There was a group called the Hasmoneans who were a family or a group of people. And he thought, it got into his mind, that they were going to overthrow him. So he had every one of them murdered, killed. So they wouldn't have a chance to kill him. People thought in those days, well, perhaps the safest place to be is in the family of Herod. Maybe because I'm a family member of Herod then I'm, I'm on easy street, right? Well, let me just tell you that that's false. Think again. Herod had ten wives, and he had twelve children. One of those wives was Mary Amni. Uh, she had a brother called Aristobulus, and he thought, Herod thought, that her brother Aristobulus would overthrow him one day, so he invited him down to Jericho to go for a swim in the springs down there. So the guy comes down, he goes for a swim, and Herod had his thugs in the water, and as they were swimming, the thugs hold him under the water and drown him and kill him. All because Herod thought that he might want to overthrow him and sit on his throne. Well, it wasn't very long after that that Herod would kill his mother-in-law, Mary Amy's mother, because he thought that she was uh, suspicious of him and he didn't like her bugging him all the time. Okay? This is a wicked man. This is a wicked dude. Then he would go on to kill Mary Ann. You can read a little bit about her in history. Uh, somebody asked Mr. Charles the other day, I was listening to a conversation over, over her, uh, what they were asking him, and uh, they said, Mr. Charles, uh, where are the best Christmas lights in town? Where do you think the best Christmas lights in town? And uh, they said, well, you think it's out in Greenville, Roper Mountain Road's got some Christmas lights. Shad got down in Toronto. We went down there. They've got some Christmas lights down there. Or do you think it's over in Gatlinburg? He said, I'm going to tell you, the best Christmas lights of the holiday season are the taillights on my relatives' cars as they're leaving. To go home. <laughs> uh, you may not like your family members, but I guarantee you that you're not like uh, Kim Perry. 
Um, Mr. Charles, I'll just stop giving you more time before I love you. Uh, he didn't really say that. He loves each and every one of you. I promise. But I don't think anyone would go to the uh, lengths that uh, King Herod has gone to, killing family members. In fact, he would go on to kill two more of his sons because he thought that they were trying to overthrow him. King Herod's sons did uh, eventually reign. You can read about them in the life of John the Baptist a little bit later. Later, uh, Herod Archelaus and Herod Antipas and uh, uh, Philip and other sons, and they fought amongst themselves, and they would kill people, they would kill family members, on and on and on. So this legacy of hatred was instilled in the Herodian line. There's one more thing that I think is significant that I think we ought to mention about the wickedness of Herod, so you'll get an idea of him. On the day that he was dying, on the, on the, it was evident that he was uh, about to expire. He was about 70 or 80 years old at the time of his death. And so uh, he said, I'm, I'm dying soon, so here's what I want you to do. So the, the, he took um, the rulers that he had put under him. He said, I want you to put into prison all of the leading Jewish people, all of the people that are re uh, respectable, well thought of uh, in, the, in, the, in the town in Jerusalem. I want you to put them in prison. You can just trump up some charges against them, put them in prison, and on the day that I die, I want you to execute them. And I'm like, what in the world? Why in the world would you want us to do that? He says, because I know that there will, at the day of, that I die, there will be laughter, there will be celebration on the day that I die, and I want there to be mourning. So I want eyes to cry. I want tears to flow on the day that I die. So you execute all of the leading citizens in, in, in uh, Jerusalem at this time. He was a wicked, wicked man. So can you imagine having understood a little bit about who he is? When the wise men come in and say this, where is the king of the Jews? How threatened he was. How troubled he was. When you read that word trouble, it's not just like, hmm, I gotta work this out. What does that mean? It's it's I'm I'm willing to kill, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. You say, well, that's Herod. That's not necessarily the Jews. Oh, really? They were six miles away, and no one showed up to meet King Jesus. They were self-satisfied. They were consumed with living and keeping Herod off their backs. They were living in fear. And they were just as foolish as he was. But in contrast to Herod and to the Jews, wise men came in search for the living God. And I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly believe that we will meet these folks one day, as many as there are. I believe we'll see them in heaven one day. Why do you say that? Because of verse 11. Look down there with me just for a moment. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. This is the right response of any sinner when face to face, when they meet the most holy high God, okay, is to fall down and worship him. I don't think, I don't think they totally understood the importance of why they were coming. I don't think fully until they saw the young man, the child, and were in his presence. I think the, the star, whether it was a physical star, whether, whether it was the glory of God shining for them to go forth, I don't think they fully understood until they knocked on the door, walked in. And their response was to fall on their face and worship God. Not only is that the response for any sinner, but it is our continual response as those who are saved. We should continue to fall on our faces before a just, holy, and righteous God to ask for forgiveness, to keep our sins on short account so that we will continue to to be in good stead with him. The, very, the rest of this verse, the rest of the next sentence, then, after they worshipped him, after they fell on their faces, then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
some of the most costly things, even gold today is still very costly for us, some of the best gifts that they could have brought him in these possessions. Their, their gifts that they brought him were of great value. But these gifts pale in comparison to the gift that he would in turn give to the world. You see, his gift is not bound by time or space. His gift is not material. It's eternal. His gift is salvation for the world, for whoever believes in his name. It's through his blood that he would shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. If you have received this gift of salvation, you know that it's not of works of righteousness which you have done. That's what a gift is. Gift is, if you look at the word as itself, it's free. It's unearned. You don't do anything to, do, to, to gain it. All you do is say yes to Jesus. And many of you have said yes to Jesus. And here's what, for those of you who have received the gift of salvation, I want you to remember the gift. And most likely you're going to sit on uh, Christmas Day just a few days from now. And you're going to open gifts from people who have loved you and want to give you a gift. <coughs> But I want you to remember the gift that Jesus offered to you. Perhaps it was a year ago. Perhaps it was 10 years ago. For some of you, it was 40 or 50 years ago. But the gift doesn't lose value just because it was bought a while ago. Some of you have seen the movie The Grinch. And in the movie The Grinch, he says, this line, and I, I always remember this line, he stands in the dump and says, all that's going to happen to your gifts in a few years from now, even a year from now, is they're going to come down the trash chute and they're going to end up at my place. That's not true with Christ's gift. It's eternal. Why? Because he did everything necessary to accomplish it. Our hope is in him. Our, our, our hope is in one who lives and reigns forever. Our hope is in King Jesus, the King of the Jews. It's not in Herod, equivalent to our government today. It's not in our government today. Our hope is in King Jesus, King of the Jews, King of the Gentiles, King of the world. 